on on Friday, we were talking about two events that lead up to um, the Civil War, two events that are unique to Georgia, one being the landing of the last slave ship um, to make port in the United States. That would be the Wanderer. And, of course, we talked about the men that were involved with that and the fact that they're charged with a crime and they're found not guilty. They actually have violated the Slave Trade Act of 1807 but what are they charged with? Piracy. And they're found not guilty. Um, and of course, that just makes folks in the North really angry because there was a clear violation of the law. And then we talked about the weeping time that happens in March of 1859, the sale of 436 slaves, the breaking up of families, um, all because Pierce Butler was... Um, let me see how I can put this. He was a drunken frat boy. It's basically what he was. Um, wasteful. Um, and of course, incredibly rich until he wasn't, and that's why the sale of his slaves. Both of those events lead us to 1860. Now, what happens in 1860? Abraham Lincoln runs for president. He's elected. The primary reason he's elected is because the Democratic Party has split. And so the vote among the Democrats is split. And Lincoln becomes the first Republican president. So 1860, November of 1860, Lincoln's elected. And immediately, southern states begin to talk secession. South Carolina secedes on December the 20th of 1860 and begins immediately to look at federal property in the state of South Carolina controlled by the military because they want it. They need it. They can't have the Army and the Navy hanging about in South Carolina. And so they begin to um, tell the commander of Fort Sumter, which is in Charleston Harbor, a man named Colonel Robert Anderson. They begin to communicate with him, telling him, you've got to leave Fort Sumter. Anderson is like, no, not going to do it. Don't have to. You don't own this. The United States government owns this. I work for them. I'm not leaving. Southerners um, give him time. And they are continually communicating with him. The commander of the Confederate forces in Charleston at the time is Major General P.G.T. Beauregard. It's Pierre Gustav something. Beauregard. <clears throat> And we see something at Fort Sumter that we're going to see played out throughout the Civil War. We're going to see men who have fought alongside each other. We're going to see men who have gone to school with each other. We're going to see men who have been student to teacher or student, yeah, student to teacher. Um, and they're all going to be fighting against each other. And that's what we see here in Charleston. Colonel Robert Anderson had been an instructor at West Point. P.G.T. Beauregard had been a student at West Point. Anderson had been his artillery instructor. Anderson was about to find out just how good an artillery man P.G.T. Beauregard was. By April of 1861, it's a foregone conclusion that Fort Sumter is going to be taken, or at least the, the, the Confederate forces, the South Carolinians, are going to try to take Fort Sumter. Um, the U.S. Army um, has not been able to really reinforce Fort Sumter, resupply Fort Sumter, so they're running out of food, they're running out of water. Um, Beauregard continues to give Anderson a chance to surrender the fort and to leave. He doesn't. And so April 12th, 1861, uh, Beauregard gives the order. It's midnight. He gives the order to commence firing, and they begin to fire on Fort Sumter. Those are the first shots of the American Civil War. Anderson eventually surrenders the fort. He strikes the flag. It's folded. They get on a boat and they leave. And the Confederates take over Fort Sumter. It's kind of an ironic thing. Kind of not really ironic, but just kind of a, a neat thing. Because almost four years to the date that Robert Anderson left Fort Sumter, he returns takes that same flag, and runs it up the flagpole. 
Um, and of course, by then, the war is over. The Civil War would become the America's bloodiest war. And in fact, today, it's still America's bloodiest war. In fact, you take all the other deaths and all the other wars from American wars, and they don't even begin to touch the number of people that died during the American Civil War. Stop it! Um, it does not even touch the number of people that died during the American Civil War. Um, if you're looking at like kind of old scholarship, you know, if you go back to things that were written during the 1900s, early 1900s, even up until the time I was your age in the 1970s, um, the figure that's used is about 620,000 deaths. Modern scholarship puts it more like 750,000 deaths. If you put that in today's numbers, even if it's just, just 620,000, that would be 6 million people based on today's population. If it's 750,000, then of course that's 7 million. Um, and here, I don't know if I put this in your note. I did, didn't I? Okay. You can kind of see, you'd have to bump up Iraq and Afghanistan somewhat. But, um, I mean, the closest is World War II. 405,000 Americans die um, during that war. Um, one of the things about the American Civil War is that it becomes the first war where people are actually able to see what happens during a battle. And it's not necessarily because battles are being fought in people's backyards. They are. But it's more because of technology. Now, they don't have TV. The Internet has not even been thought of. Radio is non-existent. What they do have is photography. I guess is photography. And we're going to look at a lot of different pictures over the next um, week or so about um, different topics in the Civil War, but a lot of pictures that were taken during the Civil War. And they're printed in newspapers, but a photographer like Matthew Brady, who's probably, well, he's not probably, he is the most famous of the Civil War photographers, he would go to a city and he would put on a show. People would be allowed to come in and view his photographs. And they didn't really like what they saw because they were gruesome. And you'll see some of those. I mean, that one behind you or behind this graphic is not really gruesome, but people had never seen that kind of thing before. And it disturbed them. And so, um, both sides, particularly the North, because they had more photographers, um, people see these things and they begin to push for an end to the war because they don't like what they see. All right, here's a Civil War picture. It's an early one. Anybody know where that is? Fort Sumter. Yes, yeah, it's Fort Sumter. Is that before or after the battle? It's after. Why? What gives it away? First of all, there's a, the Confederate flag. Confederate national flag is flying. And then, is there a roof here? Do you think there used to be a roof? Yeah. yeah. You know, the fort caught on fire. That stuff that was combustible burned. Um, but yeah, the flag, I think, is the clear giveaway. Um, what else do you notice about the flag? What? It's flying. And you're not wrong. If I, if I take this flag right here and just hold it out, does it look like that one? In a way it does, but can you really see the detail of that flag? No, you can't of this one. Why? Because it's not moving and it is... Yeah. Flag's moving. And because the flag's moving, it's blurry. And that's simply because of the technology that's being used. It's wet glass photography. They take a literally a pane of glass. They would treat it with chemicals. They would put it in the camera. 
They would open the shutter, wait three or four minutes, and the picture would appear on the negative, on that piece of wet glass. Anything that's moving is blurry. So these guys, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, those nine guys are doing what? Right? This guy's got the hard job. He's got that. Okay? It's a staged photograph, isn't it? Hey, y'all, come on. Let's take a picture. Blah, 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 blah. By the way, don't move. Okay? Then you got some other people in the picture. They're kind of, you know, sticking their head in the background. You got two right here, so that's what, 11? There's another one here. You can't really see him, but that's 12. There's one right there, so that's 13. What else do you see in the picture? Okay, they're windows. Yeah. Uh, no. Um, I don't know if it's ash or dirt or whatever it is. Up here? Where? No, I don't think so. Um, now, we don't have to use that kind of technology anymore, do we? We take a picture, and what do we do? Just push a button, and instantly we can put it on Facebook, we can put it on Instagram, we can do whatever, right? Snappy chat. MySpace. Um, but if I take a picture, if I take any picture on my phone and I start to blow it up, what happens to it? Does it come more defined or does it get blurry? It pixelates because a digital picture is nothing but pixels. Did you say pixelate? All right. Um, that doesn't happen with these pictures. Now, this is a probably a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. But if I go to National um, Archives in Washington, D.C. or the Library of Congress, because both have a collection of wet glass negatives, and if I take that and I make a picture from that negative, I can blow that picture up as big as I possibly can. And it's still as clear as if it were the original photograph. So that's one of the cool things about um, Civil War photography is the clarity of it and the things you were able to see. And I'm going to show you a couple of things over the next few days that um, are really kind of cool. Um, most Civil War photographs are staged. They even went so far as to put dead people where they wanted them to be. Wow. And they went so far as to have people pose as dead people when they really weren't dead. Okay? Simply because they were trying to tell a story with a picture. But we have some, some pretty amazing photographs of Civil War battlefields. Um, you know, the aftermath of war, that's really what you're seeing, the aftermath of battle. So, um, well, guess what? On Friday, we're going to have some here. Um, that's why you're not having a test on Friday. You're having it on Monday. So, no. Um, Fort Sumter is attacked, and after that, Virginia secedes from the Union. Robert E. Lee surrenders his commission. And then North Carolina and Arkansas follow, and then finally Tennessee in June. The yellow states, we call those the what? Border states. They're slave states, but they never secede from the Union. Um, West Virginia actually becomes one of those border states when it's created I want to say in 1863, but I'm not certain. I need to look that up. Um, they don't want to secede, but they still want their slaves. Abraham Lincoln, in January of 1863, issues the Emancipation Proclamation. And in it, he frees all the slaves south of that red line right there. 
Why doesn't he free the slaves in the border states? What would the border states have done had Lincoln freed the slaves? They would have seceded as well. And if they had seceded, Civil War turns out differently. First of all, Washington, D.C. falls because it would have been surrounded, literally surrounded by Confederate states and troops. So um, that's what we have in 1861. And of course, after Fort Sumter, there's a lull. Both sides are getting ready. Um, you can walk over here and look at this particular um, map. This is dated July 13th, 1861. Um, and it is what the New York Herald, or where the New York Herald thinks Confederate troops are. There's another map below it um, that's talking about the Grand Army of the Potomac. That would be the U.S. Army. Um, and then this picture it is a picture of the first battle of Bull Run or the first battle of Manassas. It's pretty cool. Notice it is not a photograph. What is that? It's a drawing. Because a photograph would have been too blurry. All right. So, Fort Sumter Falls. Um, President Lincoln immediately calls for 75,000 volunteers to join the U.S. Army. The U.S. Army in 1860, 1861 is very tiny. It's very small. It's a peacetime army. And um, as a result, there aren't enough men to fight a war. And so Lincoln calls for 75,000 volunteers. He gets twice that. Um, he calls upon the, the patriotism of American citizens in the North. And they respond. They're ready to put down the rebellion. Everybody thinks this is going to be, it's not going to take long. You know, the first battle, the, the Confederacy is going to turn and run. Well, the thing is, the South is thinking the same time. The first battle, we're just going to whoop them so bad, they're going to turn around and run. Well, that's not what happens. Um, Washington, D.C. becomes the most fortified city in the world during the Civil War. There are more forts surrounding it than any other city in the world. Um, Lincoln's volunteers, um, by July of 1861, they're ready to fight. Those three newspapers are dated July of 1861. Um, and... Uh, they meet at a place called Manassas. It's also called Bull Run. Um, and to tell you how strange things were, mamas and daddies put their babies in their wagons and rode out to see the battle. Let's go down to Manassas and watch the whooping. Okay, And it, it's back and forth. The whole um, first part of the battle is back and forth. Nobody really gets a clear advantage. The North gets a slight advantage. Stonewall Jackson um, earns his name Stonewall. He, somebody sees him um, rallying his troops, and, and this person says, see, there's Jackson standing like a stone wall. And so it becomes Stonewall Jackson. The South the Confederacy goes on to um, issue a severe beating to the, to the Union Army. Um, and it becomes a rout, and the Union Army heads back to Washington, D.C. Only problem is, as they're leaving, they have to navigate all the civilians that have come from Washington, D.C., and who are now trying to get back to Washington, D.C. And so it's just a mess. What? Uh, sometimes, you know... Um, you would, would plan where you're going to meet your enemy most of the time. I mean, I shouldn't say that. Sometimes it's like, uh-oh, we ran into these guys. Okay, Gettysburg, which is the bloodiest battle in the Civil War, 
starts because two really small groups of soldiers run into each other. And it becomes a running battle through the town of Gettysburg. Um, and it's not until the next day that the big armies show up. So nobody ever plans. I don't think anybody ever plans a battle. Huh? Well, you, you know, you, you got to be prepared. It's kind of like uh, Mike Tyson. Y'all know who Mike Tyson was? He said, hey, everybody got a plan until you get hit in the mouth. And then the plan goes out the window. And that's true. You know, think about any athletic activity that you have. Everybody's got a plan, right? Until they don't. Until they get hit in the mouth. Or, you know, somebody scores 27 runs in the first inning. And your plan kind of goes out the window. So, um, the question becomes, how do we build an army? The United States has to answer that question. They call for volunteers. The Confederacy certainly does. They don't have an army. Each state has its own militia, but they do not have a standing army. And so, um, they call for volunteers. And after they have gotten all the volunteers they can get, they create a draft. Men are drafted, both sides, to serve in the army. Now, sometimes men are drafted and they're given a bounty. They're given money. Or they volunteer and they're given money to sign up. It's like a bonus. Today, um, you know, I, I would imagine Jacob's dad has been given a reenlistment bonus before. You know, hey, if you'll serve, you know, you'll sign on for three more years, we'll give you $10,000, whatever. Okay? And people do it. What they were doing during the Civil War, though, is they were signing up, they'd get their bounty, and then they'd run away. They would desert and go to another unit, sign up, get their bounty, and run away. There weren't an awful lot of people that were doing that, but there were enough to take notice. Now, when the draft is created, you have this taking place. Let's just say that Ian is a poor yeoman farmer in Georgia. I'm not. I'm a planter. I got more money than God. Okay? And I know that Ian is poor, so I go to him and say, Mr. Shepard, I will give you $3,000 if you will take my place in the Confederate Army. It's a lot of money in 1861, 1862. Um, and so Ian says, yes, and it's a pretty good deal for him unless... He dies. And then it's not so good a deal. But that was happening. And what happens during the Civil War, in fact, I think it was always true in the Civil War, is it became a rich man's war fought by the poor man. Exactly. I mean, think about it. What was the Civil War about? It's about slavery. Who owned slaves in the South? The wealthy. Who's doing all the fighting? It ain't the wealthy. It's the poor guys like my great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather, who lost his arm at Manassas. Left arm. Gone clean clear up to the elbow. Unless he was left-handed. So, um, what we see is a, a rich man's war becomes a war that's fought by the poor man. Now, how many of you have ever heard that black soldiers fought for the Confederacy? Anybody ever heard that? Okay. Can I tell you something? It ain't true. Okay. I mean, it, it says in my notes that almost all the black men that fought, fought for the Union. I think you could say all fought for the Union. Um, in 1865, the early part of 1865, late part of 1864, the Confederate government said, hey, let's put black soldiers into the lines. Um, they never do, but they made it where they could. And I think the reason they don't is they realize they're not going to fight for us. Yes? There, there's that. And, and also, if, if they're fighting for the Confederacy, what are they fighting for? Their own enslavement. Okay? 
But there's almost 180,000 enlisted men that serve in the United States Army as soldiers. And again, it's not until 1864, I think, that um, legally black men are allowed to fight for the United States Army, but they do. There's like 175 regiments that are created. The black soldiers, they have white officers. Um, and again, almost 180,000. Actually, it's closer to 210,000. Um, and they are the United States colored troops. If you ever see that on a tombstone or if you're reading something that says USCT, that's a reference to the U.S. colored troops, the United States colored troops. Um, there's about 3,500 from Georgia that serve in the USCT. Most of them were um, either escaped slaves who had gone north and they chose to fight for their freedom, for the freedom of their families, or they took up with William Sherman when he came through Georgia in 1864 because thousands followed Sherman um, as he went through Georgia. Somebody asked the other day, how old did you have to be to serve? Ten. There were ten-year-olds who fought in the Civil War. Now, they didn't carry weapons. They were drummer boys. And the, the question I think you have to ask yourself, okay, what was the purpose of the drummer boy? Well, if I'm a commander and I've got a drummer boy and I want people to hear what I want them to do, I'm going to tell him to play a certain cadence. It might be retreat. It might be advance. It might be, hey, watch your right flank. Watch your left flank. Drummer boy is going to beat that out and people are going to hear it. How'd they get their drum? There was a, like snare drum. So, um, who am I going to shoot first? Drummer boy. Because you've got to be able to hear him. He, he's got to be he's got to be accessible. He has to be heard. And Civil War commanders didn't lead from the rear. Okay, so you kill the uh, the drummer boy, and you've taken away communication. Then who do you kill? No, you kill the flag bearer. Why? Because that flag is, if you can't hear anything, um, you should be able to see the flag and know it's either moving forward or backward, and you're going to follow it. So uh, I was reading today, this morning, an article um, about a flag bearer at Fort Wagner. It's a, a battle that the U.S. colored troops fought in. I think it was the 54th Massachusetts that fought at Fort Wagner. And this soldier that I was reading about was awarded the Medal of Honor because he was the 12th flag bearer in that one battle. Eleven others had gone down. And he grabbed it and led the attack on Fort Wagner. Um, is wounded three or four times. Will not give up the flag until the battle's over. And he's been taken to the rear uh, to have his wounds cared for. But... You know, that's how important um, the flag bearer was. You, you never um, see the flag laying there. Somebody's going to pick it up and carry it. So, um, a lot of guys were your age, 14, between 14 and 16. You know, they went off to fight with their daddy or they went off to fight with their older brother or they just said, heck, there's nothing going on around here. I'm going to go join the Army. Well, some of it's patriotism on both sides. Um, some of it is young men are pretty stupid sometimes. And they think, wow, what a great adventure. And then find out in a hurry, this ain't such a great adventure. So, um, doobie doop, doop. All right, a couple of pictures here. What, do you, what can you tell me about this? Okay, died in 1896. So he did not die during the Civil War. U.S. Colored Troops. What's his name? John Marker, 26th Regiment. What company? 
Echo or E, okay? So John Marker, Company E, 26th Regiment, U.S. Colored Troops, I know when he died. I can find that out because I have a name, because I know what company he was in, what regiment he was in. I can go back and do research. Now, nobody, he might not have even known when he was born, right? because he was an enslaved person, probably an enslaved person at some point in time. He may have, but I can find out an awful lot about him. I can find out what happened to him after the war. Um, I can find out where he's from. I can find out what he did during the war, if there's any accommodations, or I can see how much he was paid. There's... Tons of stuff out there that you can learn just by looking at somebody's grave marker and then going back and doing research. Now, in this is Arlington National Cemetery in Arlington, Virginia. And um, the U.S. colored troops are buried in one section of the cemetery. They're segregated. Now, today they're not. Not, not since the 1940s have they been segregated. But at that time, they were segregated. U.S. colored troops were buried in a separate section of the cemetery. These would all be white soldiers. And some of them tell you a lot. Some of them don't tell you a lot at all or nothing at all. Like this guy, Silas Darnard. All we know is he was from Vermont. We don't know when he died. We know nothing. But you look right over here, and there's another one. Died May 24th, 1864. Um, Frank Clark, Company C, Regiment something, I can't read that. Michigan Cavalry. Huh? Charlie. Charlie. So I'll show you that, just U.S. colored troops, but also to, to tell you that, you know, you learn a lot by going and finding information in the cemetery. You can go over into Memory Hill Cemetery. And there are Confederate soldiers buried there. They're actually Union soldiers buried there. Little known fact. Um, and you can, you can get the, that information off their tombstone and go find out a lot more information about it. Kind of helps bring that person to life for us. All right. Um, this is also in Washington, D.C. It's the African American Civil War Memorial. It's the only national memorial to the U.S. colored troops in the country. Um, it's got soldiers. There are three soldiers there um, to the kind of where that woman's standing, where she would be looking if she were looking at the statue. There's a sailor. And then on the back, there's a soldier and his family as he's leaving home. So it's a, it's a pretty cool uh, memorial. It was created by Ed Hamilton, who's an African-American sculptor, um, and it's called the Spirit of Freedom. Surrounding it are these panels like this one, the 3rd Regiment, United States Colored Heavy Artillery. Uh, they're the names of 209,145 soldiers that served in 175 different regiments. There's 7,000 white officers. Um, and then I didn't know this. This was interesting. I learned this this summer. There are 2,145 Hispanic people and I'm like, okay, why are they, why are there Hispanics on the U.S. Colored Troops Memorial? Would they have been considered white? No. So they were in the U.S. Colored Troops. And then, also what I didn't know, there's about 20,000 names missing that aren't up here that will be added, but they're not there now. Um, and those are sailors who actually served in the U.S. Navy. The U.S. Navy was not segregated. In other words, black men and white men fought and lived together in the U.S. Navy. And they're not on there um, yet. They will be added. So it's a pretty cool statue. Um, and Ed Hamilton does some really neat stuff. So look up Ed Hamilton, Google Ed Hamilton, and see what you find. All right. So how many people served? In the U.S. Army, there were 2,125,948 people who served during the Civil War. In the Confederate Army, 
there's 1,082,119. Are those totally accurate? No. Probably not. But they're close. And again, you look at older scholarship and it will say 620,000 people died. 620,000 perished. But modern scholarship puts that number at more like 750,000. And again, you, you take that and, and use the percentage of population and apply it to today, and you get 6 million to 7 million that died during the U.S. Civil War. Um, there are about 120,000 Georgians that serve. Um, most of them served um, in the Army of Northern Virginia. In fact, if you start looking at major battles that the Army of Northern Virginia is involved in, you'll see regiments from Georgia, the 4th Georgia, the 21st, um, the 64th, just all kinds of different troops from Georgia. And again, um, men in different outfits would all be from the same area. For example, in Milledgeville, the Baldwin Blues were created, and they become a part of the Army of Northern Virginia. Um, we have Georgians that served in the U.S. Army. Um, probably the most significant would be Montgomery Miggs. Montgomery Miggs was a graduate of West Point. He actually graduated with Robert E. Lee. He's from Georgia, but he chose to stay in the United States Army. He, his feeling was, I took an oath, and I'm going to be a man of my word. He hated Robert E. Lee. Because Robert E. Lee did the exact opposite. He thought Lee was a traitor. And in fact, at the end of the war, he calls for the execution of Robert E. Lee. Of course, that doesn't happen. Um, and again, um, about 3,500 black Georgians serve in the U.S. colored troops. Now, what we can come up with, the best thing, the best estimate we can come up with is that somewhere between 11 and 25,000 Georgians died during um, the Civil War, either from wounds or disease. And most people, honestly, who died during the war died from disease. Um, my question for you is, why such a large range? Hmm? It's inaccurate. Why is it inaccurate? Because by the end of the war, what's happened to the Confederate Army? It's in disarray. They aren't keeping really good records. And so we, we don't really know. We think, based on population, statistics, blah, blah, blah. Yes. Yeah. Um, Union soldiers died here in Georgia. There were battles fought here in Georgia. Probably the biggest would be the Battle of Chickamauga, which is up near um, Chattanooga, Tennessee, just inside the Georgia border. Um, the second bloodiest battle of the Civil War takes place at Chickamauga, Chickamauga Creek. Um, and, and during that battle, about 16,000 Union soldiers are either killed, wounded, or go missing. Um, why would a person go missing? Well, it might be I've had enough and nobody will ever miss me, so I'm leaving. Or they take a direct hit from an artillery shell and there's nothing left of them. Or they die and nobody knows. They're buried in, a, in an unmarked grave somewhere. Um, Andersonville, which is down in South Georgia, there is literally nothing in Andersonville. Today, there's nothing in Andersonville. Um, it's a small farming community. Um, the National POW Museum is at Andersonville um, Prison Camp. There's a recreation of the prison camp. Um, there's a cemetery that holds about 13,000 Union soldiers who died right there. And that was pretty typical. You were buried where you died. Either literally, or they dug a big mass grave and... <laughs> Prisoner of war. Prisoner of war. That black flag that hangs from the flagpole is the POW MIA flag, Prisoner of War Missing in Action. And that came out of the Vietnam War. 
All right, so let's see what we got here. Oh, yeah. Um, this is a picture of the 4th Georgia Infantry. I think this is at Chancellorsville, which was a pretty big battle. Um, this guy right here with his hat in his hand and the kind of blondy red hair with the sword is George P. Doles. Now, why do I show you a picture of George P. Doles? There he is over there, too. Um, that's because he's from Milledgeville. He, um, he formed a group, became the colonel of that group, of that outfit, becomes a part of the Army of Northern Virginia, fights in just about every major battle that the Army of Northern Virginia is involved in, including Antietam and Gettysburg, um, and is killed at the Battle of Cold Harbor because he was stupid. Um, he is up at the front, and he is inspecting the breastworks or the fortifications that have been dug by his men, and he makes himself an inviting target, and somebody shoots him right through the heart. He's dead before he hits the ground. Um, his body is brought back to Milledgeville, and he's actually buried in Memory Hill Cemetery. There's also a road. If you go down Elbert Street to the four-way stop past the Huddle House, and you keep going, and you take that curve, you're going to drive onto what is called Dole's Boulevard named after George P. Doles. Um, and just so you don't think I'm picking sides, I, I haven't put it here. I've got it somewhere else in my, in my notes. There's a young man from Milledgeville who joined the Confederate Army, deserted from the Confederate Army, and joined the Union Army, would become a lieutenant in the Army. And as Sherman comes through Milledgeville, he is Sherman's aide. He is Sherman's guide through Milledgeville, um, and I'll talk to you more about him a little later. So people from Georgia, people from right here that are involved in the Civil War. All right, um, battles, and you can tell there aren't a lot. Most of them take place where? North, between really Chickamauga and Atlanta. This, of course, would be the Battle of Atlanta. A lot of little battles are fought, and then... Um, the big battle for um, Atlanta. You get out of Atlanta and you see less and less. Most of them are November and December of 1864. Um, you get to Savannah and there's really one battle that's fought in 1864 around Savannah and that's at Fort McAllister. Fort Pulaski is in 1862. Fort McAllister, the first battle, is fought in 1863. There's one little battle fought near Milledgeville, the Battle of Griswoldville. Y'all ever heard of that? Griswoldville. Um, really insignificant battle that takes place unless you were part of the Georgia militia that fought that day, and then it was pretty significant because you stopped breathing. Because it was, it was a massacre. In fact, um, Union officers after the battle, Union soldiers after the battle walked the battlefield and they couldn't help but notice how young and how old Confederate soldiers were. In fact, they weren't soldiers at all. Some of them didn't even have guns. They had, No, well, they were, essentially, but they had what were called Joe Brown's pikes. It was a long spear with a metal tip on it, and that's what they went into battle with. And at least one Union officer remarked, this is not war, this is murder because they were so young and they were so old, because that's all that was left. All right. I think we can get through this. Um, one of the, the big, one of the eventual telling things in the Civil War will be resources. The North simply has more. In fact, on paper, you look at it on paper, and there's no way this war should have lasted four years. The South, the Confederacy, simply does not have the resources to draw this war out for as long as they do. But they do. Uh, the North has more resources, more people, so they can create an army, they can resupply that army pretty easily, have more factories, better railroad, and they grow most of the food. The South does not grow food, or very little. What the South has going for them are their leaders, their leadership. 
Most have fought in the Mexican-American War. Uh, most are West Point um, educated, not all. There's some very um, able leaders in the South that had no military experience, just like there were in the North. Um, they kind of learned because they had to. Um, but their, their military leaders are better, at least in the beginning of the war. Um, and there's a motivation. We're going to defend our homeland. We're going to defend um, our homes, and we're going to win our independence. What we're not going to do is grow food. We're going to grow cut. Why? Because they need that to get supplies and weapons from other places. So they trade cotton. It's important for them. That's why they're not growing food. And just some graphics that show us the difference. The Union has 23 million people. The Confederacy, not quite 9 million. It's a big discrepancy. Then you look at manufactured goods, industrial workers, and railroad mileage. The North has a large advantage over the South in every category. So, how are we going to win the war? Well, the North says we're just going to strangle the South. Winfield Scott comes up with the plan called, that he calls the anaconda plan. What's an anaconda do to its prey? Squeezes it to death. So the idea is we'll just squeeze the South to death. We'll blockade Georgia's coast. Not only Georgia's coast, but the coast of the Confederacy. All right, we'll pick up with that tomorrow.